So, Marion, my friend, it's been many years. Yeah, it's so been glad, too long. So glad to see you again. Good um, to see you. You know the reason why I'm here? Yes. I'm here to cover the one-year anniversary of the Joplin tornado coming up. I've been just been driving around, and I've just been just so speechless. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to think about how it was like the days after. Yeah. It was pretty... Tell me about what happened on that fateful day, Marion, May 22nd, 2011. Um, well, I was not at home when the siren sounded. I was uh, at the mall, which is about five minutes from here. And I was just getting in my car and I thought, well, I, you know, it was one of those decisions that later on you'd question yourself, should I have gone back in or what? But what I decided to do was to come on home because I knew I was close to home and turned on the TV to see what they were saying about it. And they were, they were saying, the, we believe there's a tornado. We believe it might be on the ground, but we can't see it yet. Um, I don't remember exactly what was being said. Memory problems are part of the trauma. Anyway, so I, uh, I began to uncover the crawl space that I, that I would plan to use as a, as a shelter if I needed to. And by the time I got that accomplished and came back in and looked at the TV, they were showing a tower cam picture of the tornado. And they were saying, this looks like a tornado. It was rain wrapped. You couldn't see the, the rotation of it. But then you began to see transformers exploding at the base of it. And they said, okay, this is on the ground. This is, take cover now. Take cover anywhere in the city of Joplin. Take cover now. And I couldn't tell which way the tower cam was pointed. So I couldn't tell. Are they looking at Schifferdecker? Are they looking west? Are they looking east? Because if they were looking east, it could be right on top of me. And so I hurried to get myself into that crawl space and, and cover up. And um, I had always heard that a tornado sounded like a freight train. And I grew up near a train track, so I know what a freight train sounds like. I have like, you know, memories of 20 years of that. And I began to hear the sound of a freight train, and I thought, oh my God, it's actually going to hit me. And the sound got louder and louder, and then it became more like jet engines and more like an explosion. And so I was hunkered down in the little crawl space hole, and finally the windows started breaking out right over my head. And uh, I just compacted myself into a ball as much as I could. But then I began to feel the air being sucked out of the crawl space around me. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sucked out of this crawl space because that does happen to people. You know, you get into something that you think can protect you and the, and the, the, the pressure sucks you out. Um, it, it's indescribable the amount of the force behind that, that wind and the, anyway, so um, the, the, Rotation when it hit my house came directly from the north to south, which I was in the north end. Uh, I, uh, I could hear the windows breaking. I could hear debris crashing in uh, over my head, around me. And I just kept thinking, this is how I'm going to die. This is how I'm going to die. This is it. And uh, so I have no, no notion of how long it took for it to pass over me. It felt like forever. Uh, it might have been a minute or two or five um, and when it was over, I waited for a long time because you hear other stories of the back end of it passing over and people coming out too soon. And so I waited until, until it sounded like it was far past me when I started trying to emerge. And I was, there was debris on top of me and on top of the cover of the crawl space. And so it took me a few minutes to extricate myself. And when I, d I thought the house was gone because I could feel rain coming down on me while I was in the crawl space. It's actually a, an access hole that takes you into the crawl space. Um, but it turned out that the roof had separated from that area of the back porch. And so that's where the rain was coming down. But I thought, you know, prepare yourself for the fact that the house is gone. If the house is gone and you're alive, that's a good deal. I kept telling myself, if you're alive, it doesn't matter if the house is gone. So I was prepared for that. I was surprised to see most of the house still standing when I got out of the hole. And then I started picking my way through the house and, uh, there was about, a, a, from a foot to two feet of debris. Uh, in the in the whole length of the house, uh, a lot of fiberglass insulation. I you know I assumed that it came from other people's houses and maybe mine, but it was just thick, and I was covered in it. I was just filthy with mud and and fiberglass and all kinds of dirt and and um, the uh, the debris that rained in. There was there was nothing that wasn't in it, and I I, I would later find dog toys and and you know kitchen things that didn't belong to me. You know, there's no telling how far away some of this stuff came from. Um, the front windows were pushed out as one big unit and smashed into the outer porch um, uh, windows. 
And so I was lucky that I could get the front door open and the outer door open and go outside and, and I heard screaming. So I don't know if someone nearby was killed or finding someone, you know, um, it was, it was, you, you hear the word surreal and it's kind of maybe overused, but I, I really couldn't come up with a better word. It, when you're in shock like that, it's kind of like being in a dream state. First, I was surprised that I was alive and able to walk, you know, then, then I started trying to take inventory of, well, what else was harmed? Did someone else need my help? It was very chaotic outside, but also eerie in that you could hear sirens a long way off. You could hear people, you know, trying to find people, but it, it was sort of like the cavalry's not coming. They can't get to you. You're on your own. You know, I knew that right away. And I heard a helicopter overhead at some point, And I thought, what is that? Is that news helicopter? Is that an ambulance helicopter? And so I first, I, I had my cell phone with me when I, I, I had the presence of mind to grab it before I got in the hole. And so I began to try to call somebody. First tried to call 911, wouldn't go through. Then I tried calling family members, the calls wouldn't go through. I think initially after, I don't know how many minutes or an hour, one of my nieces texted me and said, are you all right? And I was just able to text her back like one word alive so that someone would know so that they could get the word out that I was at least not killed. And um, so from there, it became a question of trying to get myself out of here, which took hours and hours and hours because no one could get to me and my car was trapped in the garage because the garage door was smashed. So it took a long time. It took a long time to get out of here. And then <clears throat> it was even the next day before I started trying to take inventory of who I knew who might have been hit. And one of my coworkers was, was badly, badly injured. Well, two of, a former coworker was badly hurt. A current coworker would end up losing his leg. And so, uh, I have all kinds of blessings to count. It's really, it's hard to even think of yourself as having been through very much when other people were so badly hurt or lost someone they loved or someone. And, and I have taken to reading the obituaries every day to see if anyone I knew was among them. I know, you know, I remember when the first reports started coming out, people were worried the death toll was going to be in hundreds, thousands. thousands. And yeah. it turns out the final death toll from this tornado was 161. It right. could have been worse, but... I, I'm told by um, uh, our weather staff that was on duty that day, um, actually we, we were called in to have a meeting with guys from the National Weather Offices. They wanted to know, first of all, from, for our weather people's standpoint, um, did you have enough warning? Did you feel you had the information to get out? Is there such a thing as too much warning? Do people become complacent? But they were also asking us about our individual experiences, those of us who were in it. And um, of course, now I just forgot what you said, but you reminded me of something. What were you talking about just then? The 161. Like, no, the deaths. The deaths. Um, Jeremiah, who was uh, one of the uh, forecasters on duty, said it took him a while to get the emergency management office of, of Jasper County on the phone. And when he did, he asked them, can you tell how bad it is? And they told him, I'll never forget this. They told him it's very bad. The damage is so extensive. You know, how many dwellings and, not, and buildings were destroyed. They said, if we get out of this with fewer than 5,000 dead, we will have dodged a bullet. They were expecting 5,000 or more dead. And, you know, you, you don't want to use the word only when you're talking about 161 people because that's 161 lives lost, 161 you know, groups of family and friends who, who lost someone who, who, and some, some of these people were families that died, a, a dad and two children, you know, so you, you can't minimize that loss. But on the other hand, you, it's, it's still amazing to everybody that there weren't more people killed. Um, if it had happened on a Monday, for example, or if the graduation had been at the high school instead of at the college, there are, there are a hundred different ways that it could have been 10, 15, 20 times worse in terms of loss of life. Um, but still, 161 people, that's a lot. It's very, I mean, I, I remember thinking when they began giving death tolls, I remember thinking, there's no way I'm not going to know some of these people. There's no way. The odds are against, you know, that many people, you're going to have to, somebody in your life is going to have been killed. And so far, nobody that I know well is among the dead. Same thing here. I yeah. was so ex 
I was I was blessed to hear. I didn't know anyone here in Joplin who died, but mm-hmm. still, yeah, lives were lost. So, yeah. h- how do you think Joplin? Do you think Joplin has changed since the tornado? Sure. Marion? Yeah. Um, it's changed. I mean, uh, obviously, a lot of wonderful, wonderful things that are happening have happened. Um, the Saturday after the tornado, six days later, my family and I were here trying to do salvage operations, see what of mine could be salvaged. Try and yeah, well, I had two enormous old growth maple trees that were lost, and they were having to cut those up and prepare them to be carried away. And the neighbors were all up and down the street. It was really, excuse me, it became a very busy street street neighborhood because everybody was doing the same thing trying to salvage what they could and then these volunteers started arriving that just I I was so overwhelmed they came from everywhere um there there was a but a lot of them had come to feed people you know we had just packed up bottles of water and sandwiches so that we would you know have something to keep us um sustained people were coming up down the street with truckloads of um food from Subway and Long John Silver's and handing it out. Um, And there was, at one point, my niece came in in the house and said, come out here, they've got barbecue for us to eat. And this this, uh, couple who ran a barbecue restaurant in Kansas City had brought their catering equipment in the back of their pickup truck and were serving hot meals, whole meals. I mean, uh, barbecue sandwiches with mashed potatoes and corn and beans. They were just ladling these up in styrofoam containers and handing them out. I started to cry. I said, you didn't just bring sandwiches, you brought corn and potatoes. That's that's comfort food. They said, that's why we brought it. They said, this is what we do. We know how to do this. And they had all this hot equipment in the back of their pickup truck so they could feed people. I'm getting chills thinking about it. Oh my God. It was it was remarkable to see what, what people are capable of. So Joplin has changed a lot of it is, you know, we've been humbled by how how willing people are to do what they can do, whatever they can do. Um, a church group from Oklahoma was passing through, walked into my yard and asked who the homeowner was. I said, me. And they said, can we give you some money? And I was like, I, I don't know how to feel about that. I, you know, I have insurance. I don't know if maybe you can find someone you can help more. And they said, we want to help you. And they gave me some money. So the downside is that, um, and I'm very happy my home was repairable. My Only three houses on my block were repairable. The rest of them were bulldozed. All these homes across the street are new. All the homes on, you know, other side, two houses down from there on. The rest are all new houses. And that's wonderful. And I'm glad my house was repairable because I love this house, but it's sort of a double-edged sword. It's sort of like sometimes coming home at night is like returning to the scene of the crime. This is where I was attacked. This is where I was brutalized. Um, I like my house. I love my house. And, but it, the repaired version is not the same as the old version. In some ways, it's better. We did some new floors, you know, because they had to be replaced. Um, but it's not... I have to drive through the tornado zone to leave my house and to come home. There's no, there's no other way to do it. And, and all the trees in this area were lost. I mean, we have a few trees that are valiantly trying to survive. And the guys from the Department of Conservation say they won't survive because they lost too much bark. And the, the diseases and the bugs will, will kill the trees. So we're going to have no mature trees in this neighborhood for decades, you know. So it's sort of a, my my insurance guy described it as a Martian landscape. Now, the fact that the homes are built now, I, for months, I had an unimpeded view of 20th Street. I live on 17th Street. I'm not supposed to be able to see 20th Street. Mm -hmm. That's three, three rows, three streets of houses that were annihilated. Um, So now that there are houses across the street, that's better. The neighbors have put in lovely lawns. That's better. My view has improved dramatically. But I still have this, sometimes it's just really depressing, you know, to look around me and see no trees. It, it, and there, there are many efforts going on to replant trees. We will, we will have them again. Um, it's just, it's very, you can't not be reminded of it when you look out and see no trees. You think um, there's, you think Joplin in this last year, you think, Joplin, as the rebuilding process and the healing process begins, you think Joplin will come back stronger than ever, Marion? I do. I do because um, 
Well, for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which is that they decided, I mean, the, the, the powers that be, the city, the city uh, leaders and the school leaders and people who have a lot to invest decided, let's take a moment here and not just be in so much haste to rebuild that we just put everything back the way it was. We didn't ask for this opportunity, but we have it to make some things better. So the high school, you know, the insurance wouldn't let them rebuild where it was because it was in the floodplain. So they're having to move it up on the property a little bit, but it'll be better than it was before. Um, the infrastructure of town, you know, they're putting, they're going to be putting street lights in different places. They're going to be improving on the types of infrastructure that we have. So some of it, while it's taking longer to recover than, than some of us might, like 17th Street doesn't have lights on it yet, but I have a yard light, you know, so, um, but we are told they want to get it right. They don't want to just do it quickly. They want it done right so that for, for decades and, you know, years to come, it'll be better than it was, not just the same. So uh, that mentality, I think, is helping in a lot of ways. They, they, they uh, the city leaders put together, um, well, I'm not sure the right name for it, but there are, there are committees and groups dedicated to taking input from, from everyone who lives here. And they would set up displays where you could go put a sticky note on the parts that you thought were most important. Do you think the parks, the sidewalks, the, the lighting, you know, where do you think the money should be spent when it comes in? And so um, I, I think it's, you know, it's going to take a few years. It's not going to happen overnight, but it, it will come back stronger. And, you know, there was a there was actually a campaign where you'd see signs and commercials that say um, stay here you know rebuild here and i think they were afraid a lot of people would relocate i mean a lot of people have had to move outside the city limits just because there's not enough housing to go around so people have moved to carthage web city carl junction wherever wherever there's housing available but i think they were worried that the housing in joplin you know when it's rebuilt the i, I don't know I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. People want to live here. And I don't, I'm not familiar with that many people who have willingly relocated, you know, who don't plan to move back when, when they have a place to live. Is there anything else you want to add, Mary? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you um, to the people who came here and took care of me, who didn't know me, who wanted to help. Um, I know some of them were from all the way across the country. Some of them were just from other parts of Missouri who just showed up, just got in their own cars and showed up on their own, not knowing where they were going to sleep or where they were going to eat, but they just showed up and said, you know, give us something to do. Um, it meant everything.